Amen. Uh, now, are we connected here? Okay. Okay. We are going to start uh, this course entitled Discovering Jesus in the Old Testament. Okay. How many of you enjoy reading the Old Testament? Wow. Wow. How many of you would rather read the New Testament? <laughs> uh, yes, yes. Uh, I had an uh, Old Testament professor and the New Testament professor uh, arguing with each other, saying, uh, the Old Testament professor said, we have more books. <laughs> God, God started with the Old Testament. And without the Old Testament, Jesus cannot come. The New Testament professor said, uh, oh, the Old Testament professor said, uh, New Testament is only like an index to the Old Testament. Uh, and the New Testament professor said, without the New Testament, Old Testament cannot be completed. Old Testament is boring. New Testament is exciting. Old Testament, God is a God of wrath, but New Testament, God is, Jesus is a Jesus, God of love. Do you agree with that? <laughs> But they're both right in, in a way, but the Bible cannot be complete if you, it's like two pairs of shoes. You have to wear both. You have to have both to understand Jesus fully. Yeah. People say, I want to learn about Jesus, so I only read the New Testament. That is knowing only half of Jesus because Jesus was there from Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, all the way to Revelation chapter 22. Jesus is there everywhere in this Bible. And guess who else is there in this Bible? You are in this Bible. This, is, this Bible is a letter written by God to you. This is for you. It's a love letter. And so may you and I discover not only Jesus, both in the New Old Testament and the New Testament, but also yourself in this Bible. If not, this Bible only becomes an antiquated, ancient document that we are just kind of reading as a reference. But when you find Jesus and yourself in this, this becomes a living book of life. Amen? So let us begin. I had to say that because the title is so boring. Biblical theology, <laughs> Biblical theology and history of redemption. What is that? Uh, you might be thinking, I came to Tony Bible School because I didn't want to go to a theological seminary. Uh, but here we're studying theology. I promise you uh, this won't be that bad. And if, if it's bad, it's only for this first hour, okay? Let's, let's pray that, okay? Okay, biblical theology and history of redemption. The reason why I have to do an introduction on biblical theology is so you understand what you are learning, what you're reading, right? So here are some of the sources that I used for these few uh, slides. And you have more on your notes, but uh, you can follow the, the slides here. And... Uh, very great books, very long and very boring, but very great. Uh, but among them, if you want to really pick up a book and read, uh, this Hamilton, James Hamilton's What is Biblical Theology is uh, a book that I recommend. And it's very easy to read and short and concise and under, easy to understand. So these, this bibliography is probably in your notes too. Uh, if not, you can ask me later. And here are uh, the first point, disciplines of theology. Uh, and if you understand this, you might uh, you know, be able to kind of show off to your friends, uh, I know theology. Yeah, you know. Five, five disciplines of theology. There are five dis basic disciplines of theology. First is exegesis. Exegesis is probably the most laborious, monotonous, boring work because you're going through every word and every, all the syntax and grammar structure in Hebrew and Greek in the Bible. And you're analyzing these words and uh, trying to understand what it means. 
All right? And second is biblical theology. And this is pretty much what we are going to be focusing on and uh, through the three days. And we, I will be showing you some examples of how to do bibli biblical theology. Biblical theology studies how the whole Bible progresses, integrates, and climaxes in Jesus. So biblical theology takes Genesis chapter 1 and, and builds on it to see how that is fulfilled in Jesus' coming and his ministry. Hence, it is based on God's redemptive work with historical connections throughout the entire Bible. So in biblical theology, you look at the entire Bible as a whole. It's a one, one connected story. And this discipline of theology shows the unity between the Old Testament and the New Testament, how they relate and integrate to climax in Jesus Christ. And then the third discipline is historical theology. Historical theology bases its studies on the history and facts. So studying the historicity of the Bible and also studying the history of uh, different aspects of the Bible and the stories. It surveys and evaluates how significant exegetes and theologians have understood the Bible. If some of these words are too difficult and you just pass by, let them pass by. It's okay, okay? <laughs> and, and fourth is systematic theology. Systematic theology answers the question about the whole Bible, what the whole Bible is about, and the different doctrines that can be formed from the exercises of previous disciplines. So exegesis, biblical theology, historical theology. You, you study different aspects of the Bible and you put them together and, and ask the question, so who is Jesus? So what is salvation? So what are the attributes of God? So it's not on the line of literary uh, or historical. It's a combination, a whole understanding uh, of the Bible and coming down to a definition, basically. And that's called doctrine. Doctrine of salvation, doctrine of, uh, of God, doctrine of, of Christ, Christology, and so on. So uh, this is a, a quite, it's very important in church, in theology. But to me, it's very, I respect systematic theologians because you have to understand everything really understand, uh, have comprehensive, un ha comprehensive understanding of who God is, what God is saying in the Bible. So, and it attempts to show how the whole Bible fits together comprehensively rather than contradict itself. And lastly, see it went, went by pretty fast, right? Uh, five disciplines, okay, exegesis, What's next? Biblical theology, historical theology, and then systematic, and then practical theology. Practical theology studies how to apply the texts of the scripture, the understandings of, the, of systematic theology to today's context and to individual lives. And so many times it's about how, how do we understand this and put it into me and then I go act upon it, meaning in ministry or missions work or in my individual life. How do I apply this to, to my life? Okay. So second, as a second main point, let us think a little bit more about biblical theology. Biblical theology follows a general plot and focuses on the turning points in the storyline of the, of the Bible. So some of the main turning points... In the storyline, plot is creation in Genesis, and then the fall. So the creation takes place in Genesis chapter 1, and then it speaks about, it focuses more on the relationship between God and man in Genesis chapter 2, 
And then Genesis chapter 3, we see the fall taking place. Fall of mankind. Sin coming in. And then Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, God promises the seed of the woman. That's the first promise of the Messiah coming, right? So first messianic covenant or promise. And from there, this redemption and restoration work begins. Okay? And then the fulfillment, consummation in Revelation. So this is the general plot of the Bible that we are pretty familiar with. Right? It deals with temporal and canonical matters of the Bible. Okay? So where, when did it take place? What's, what happened first? And what happened as a consequence? And what is promised? When will he come? And so on. Okay? I promise you, I will not answer the question, when will he come? <laughs> so, canonical matters, uh, uh, temporal and canonical matters of the Bible, while systematic or dogmatic theology deals with atemporal matters. So, for example, systematic theology asks question like, questions like, what are the attributes of God? It doesn't really, this question is not bound in time, not necessarily. Right? What is salvation? This is more of a definition or understand, general understanding. What is sin? But biblical theology always asks and answers questions along the axis of the Bible storyline, redemptive history, and development of the canon. So the basic understanding, for, for example, it asks, what did the prophecy of Isaiah contribute to the unfolding doctrine of God? Does that make sense? Uh, easier thing is, how does the Exodus, right, the Passover and the Exodus, how does that prophesy about the coming of Jesus and his crucifixion? Okay. That's biblical theology. How do you see Jesus in the events that are taking place in the Old Testament? Why is God teaching us about Israel's history? But it's, we are not studying Israel's history necessarily. We are studying what God wants us to know. This Bible is not a history book, although it has a lot of history. This Bible is not a science book, although it does have some science and some conflicting science too, right? But this Bible's purpose is not to prove science, not to tell us history. This is not a, a literature. This book is salvation book. This book is a manual for humankind. When we buy gadgets or phone, it comes with a manual, right? When do you read the manual? Is there anybody who likes, who enjoys reading the manual? As soon as you buy a nice gadget, you leave the gadget there and you read the manual first. Anybody? I, hands up, respect you for that. All right. You read the manual when the thing breaks or is not, you know, is not working properly. Right? Now, look, look at your life. Is it working properly? <laughs> Is it functioning, functioning as it's supposed to? When God created us, it's supposed to function eternally. It's supposed to have peace, joy, happiness, and delight. And perfect reconciliation, perfect fellowship with God. Is it working like that? No. That's why God said, here's your manual. Something went wrong. Something went wrong. This Bible, its purpose is for us to be redeemed and restored. Right? And the, the key to rest, that restoration and redemption is Jesus Christ. That's why John chapter 5, verse 39, Jesus says, this whole, whole Bible, during Jesus' time, they did not have the New Testament. When he re referred to the scriptures, he's referring to the Old Testament scriptures. He says, the whole Bible is about me, Jesus said. And you read this thinking that you will have life from this. And he says, you know what? This is about me. Okay? And so that's what biblical theology is trying to do, trying to look at the Old Testament and the New Testament and figure out how they connect, what God really meant 
for us to read when he was telling us about Exodus, when he's putting us to sleep through Leviticus, you know? What does he mean about all these sacrificial, you know, uh, laws and, and ceremonial laws and all these? What, that, what does that mean? Is that somehow referring to how Jesus would die? Yes. And so that's the kind of questions that biblical theology is asking. It also seeks to find God's redemptive purpose or messianic significance in all passages of the Bible, both the Old and New Testaments. Biblical theology directly addresses the massive biblical illiteracy now prevalent in many, many of our congregations. What does that mean? Quite heavy uh, topic, and I might get myself in trouble for this. But uh, the reason why Martin Luther or John Calvin, Zwingli, these reformers, you know, church reformation, Protestant reformation, the reason why they stood up and cried out is because people were not reading the Bible during that time. And they did not know what God was really saying. They depended on church leaders to tell them, dictate to them, this is what the Bible says. But many times, it was not, right? Do you know why they did not read the Bible back then? It's because they did not have the Bible. <laughs> they did not have the Bible translated and copied in common language. That's why Martin Luther, first, one of the first things he did was to translate the Bible from Latin to German, right? Common language during that time in his, in his area. <clears throat> what about now? Are people reading the Bible? Uh, why? <laughs> why? Do they not have the Bible? Nowadays, the Bibles are going out of print. Thanks to this. Everybody who has a phone can have the Bible now. Problem is, are they reading it? Is the problem. Voltaire, a French philosopher who rejected God's existence, said this Bible, Bible will go out of print and will be extinct. People will not read it anymore in about a hundred years. He died, Bible continued on. And guess, guess what happened to his house? His house turned into Bible printing press. <laughs> yeah. But now, recently I heard in Korea, uh, there was a Christian bookstore, but it closed down because people were not buying Christian books anymore. And it became, uh, I, I shouldn't say, uh, not, uh, 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 say it, but it became a store for another religion. So right now we're living in the times when Bible illiteracy is prevalent. In, now I'm not talking about in the whole world. I'm talking about within churches. So I don't blame, really, really I don't blame them too much because, you know, Bible has a tendency to put you to sleep. Bible is difficult to understand. It's not as fun as manga or, you know, it's not as fun as these good literature. You know why? Number one, it's because they don't understand it. So we are here hoping and, and going around teaching this, hoping that the Bible be, might become fun and exciting for, for God's people. Another reason, do you know why the Bible puts you to sleep? It's because you try to read it in sleepy hours. <laughs> Do everything during the day. And you, what, what, what is the Bible reading time? Right before bedtime, usually. That's why it puts you to sleep. Anyway, uh, any uh, reference to time? What time do I need to finish? 
15 minutes. Okay. Don't worry, I have three days, so if I don't finish now, I can finish later. Okay. The, the age in which we live often seeks for a quick and easy way of living. A Christian life, uh, easy way of living a Christian life by applying drive through and fast food mentality to worshiping God. But Hosea chapter 4 verse 6, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge because you have rejected knowledge. I also will reject you from being my priest. Since you have forgotten the law of your God, I also will forget your children. <clears throat> I'd like for us to read another passage in Hosea. Hosea chapter 6, verse 1. Come, let us return to the Lord. For he has torn us, but he will heal us. He has wounded us, but he will bandage us. He will revive us after two days. He will raise us up on the third day that he may live before him, that we may live before him. And verse 6, for I delight, God, people were going through difficulties and tribulation. And they were saying, God has torn us. And I think this is kind of like our prayer during this pandemic. He has torn us, but he will heal us. Amen. He has wounded us, but he will bandage us. Verse 6, this is a reply by the Lord. For I delight in loyalty rather than sacrifice and in the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. He's saying, you guys keep on doing the sacrifice, but it's by formality, by requirement and mandatory. <clears throat> but I want your hearts and I want you to come to know me. And that's what we hope to do, uh, try to promote in our time, in our churches. <clears throat> so what are the fundamental understandings of biblical theology? Biblical theology can be done upon the basis of certain fundamental understandings about the Bible. Two things, two important things. <clears throat> Author authorship of God. Second Timothy chapter 3 verses 16 and 17 tell us, that the whole scripture, whole Bible is inspired by God, meaning God's, God breathed. It's inerrant and infallible. It is God's word. Amen? If you don't agree with that, uh, and one of the things that, uh, that the two deans and I agree is this. The Bible is fully, 100% God's word. Inerrant and infallible. It leads us to salvation. leads us to the kingdom of heaven. <clears throat> and so, biblical theology, we have to believe that this is God's word. And secondly, canonicity of the Bible. Meaning, uh, there are 66 books in the Bible, right? 39 books in the Old Testament, 27 books in the New Testament. You know that, right? Right? You know, do you know how to memorize that for your Sunday school kids? Two times seven is 39, right? Two, seven, 39. Right? Anyway. <laughs> Wrong, right? Okay. What is it? Three times nine? 27. Thank you. <laughs> 39 books in the Old Testament, 27 books in the New Testament. I thought you would. I'm just testing you if you are listening. <laughs> Three nine twenty seven. Okay, okay. Uh, the whole Bible, sixty six books of the Bible, are written by different authors. They did not meet each other, right? But somehow they talk to each other or they connect with each other. Genesis is answered in Revelation. Genesis written by Moses. Revelation written by John, prophet, uh, apostle John, right? They have never met. But it is one author, God, who wrote these 66 books through different writers. And that's why it's one book. One book. Okay? So the purpose is history of redemption. 
Biblical theology draws attention to the turning points in redemptive history. Some of the major turning points uh, we mentioned earlier, but some of the great events, the fall, exodus, forming of Israel nation at Mount Sinai, the Babylonian exile, the coming of the Messiah, and now we're looking forward to his return. Some of the big events that become pillars in the biblical uh, story. And we cannot understand many of the biblical books in depth at all unless we know the general plot and outline of the redemptive history where they fit in reference to the turning points. And these turning points are not abstract categories of systematic theology or doctrine, but God has chosen to give us his most holy word in many different literary, <coughs> excuse me, literary genres delivered across redemptive history in temporal sequence. And that temporal sequence allows us to see and have hopes for promise and fulfillment. And the redemptive work, works of God in the Old Testament, matching with the works and life of Jesus Christ in the New Testament. Okay. And lastly, the biblical theology bases Bible's plot and whole story in its history, history of redemption. So where, what, does, what is the history of redemption? History of redemption is from the point when mankind fell and there was a need for redemption. And God starts his work from then until when? Jesus comes and he says, I will come again. So until his second coming. That is history of redemption. People might argue against this, but I believe History of mankind is within the history of redemption, not the other way around. History of mankind is within the history of redemption. Okay? So, the key events in the history of redemption is the history of the relationship between God and his people. Okay? I think I bored you enough, so we go to our next one. We'll think about the history of redemption. We have about five minutes, do we? Yeah, about five minutes. Uh, we'll, we'll do about five minutes of history of redemption, and then we'll continue afterwards. And the history of redemption is, this portion is uh, actually the, the practice of biblical theology that I've introduced to you so far. And you will see how this works, okay? So I need to introduce to you what history of redemption is. And uh, the books that uh, our dean has introduced to you uh, that, that are uh, displayed out there, uh, the conference was on these books called the History of Redemption series written by Reverend Abraham Park. And this hist uh, I will be basing our studies on those books uh, from now until the third day. And f f t today and tomorrow, I'll be sharing from the first book, which is called Genesis Genealogies. Now, you're thinking, we studied theology now. Are we going to go into genealogies? <laughs> well, I'm thankful to God because you don't have a choice. You have to stay here. <laughs> if you want credits, <laughs> you have to stay here. So... I'll see you in five minutes. Uh, is it five minutes? Uh, ten minutes of break.